Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Hello, listeners. I am Appreciate you coming back once again. Today I am talking to Carolyn Birrell. She is the author of the brand new book, came out last month, called Walking with Faye, My Mother's Unconventional Descent into Dementia. Oh, she's shaking her head. I screwed it up. <laughs> I will let Carolyn give the correct title. Thank you. You almost got it. Close. It's been my pleasure to be here. Thank uh, you. Walking with Faye, My Mother's Uncharted Path Uncharted. into Dementia. She even reminded me before I pressed record, but you guys all know I'm terrible with names and titles. <laughs> so thank you for joining us today. And congratulations on the book coming out. Thank you. The cover is beautiful. And just for those of you who listen and don't, don't ever take a dive into the YouTube channel, Carolyn is actually in her wine cellar right now. <laughs> so for the people out there who enjoy wine, that's a, that's a new recording spot for me. And she's wearing a a jacket and gloves. So we're uh, going to jump right in so she doesn't uh, freeze while we do this. <laughs> so tell us about your mom and yourself and how, tell us about your mom's unconventional descent into dementia. Uncharted. Thank you. <laughs> you know, when I named the book, it was Uncharted because it, you know this, trying to follow your loved one down this path into dementia, it's completely uncharted. And as soon as you think you've got it, you don't. And as soon as you think you've, you know, steered them in one direction, they switch and they just keep you off balance the whole time. And I think that's what we've, as caregivers, we, we all have that one thing in common, this general unbalance um, of, of our certainty with our loved ones. Definitely. And that is how... Yeah, that's how I started writing the book. Um, I went to pick up my mother. I, I kidnapped her from Georgia. Uh, she wouldn't come willingly to my home in Idaho. And I had been trying for years when I finally developed this plan with my sister to surprise her with a all expenses paid summer vacation to my home in Idaho. Um, that was how we did it. Hmm. And oh, that's it was unique. It wasn't very long after I got her there that I realized um, I have a real problem and I didn't know the extent of it. I had no, no clue, no experience with dementia, especially with my mother. And um, I just started um, drowning. Hmm. Uh, one of the things I started to do was write it down because I couldn't believe it was happening. So I would just write down the strangest things she did and said. And as soon as I started looking for a book to help me, um, I realized there wasn't one at the time. This was 2012 and there are more books out there now, Oh but yes. then there weren't, there was the 36 hour day. We all know that one. It, it helped me in many ways, but it was, it, the subject matter was so far along the dementia procession. And I was dealing with a mother who seemed normal. Most of the time she was in the early stages. So I was constantly being told that I was cheating and lying and thieving, and I couldn't put that in, in perspective. And um, so, so being unable to find a book about a year or two in and writing all of these things that were going on with my mother, um, I realized I had the beginnings of a book. And then I started taking it more seriously and going back to my word document, you know, at the end of the week and say, okay, these six things happened this week. And I would jot them down. And as I went along the eight years that I had her with me, um, I, I would go back to it and finish it and <laughs> turn it into complete sentences. And, um, at the very end, I began publishing this book. Now I got two questions. Did you ever, well, let me back up one. What prompted you to quote unquote permanently kidnap your mom from Georgia to Idaho? Uh, that's a that's a great question. I kept trying not to. Um, <laughs> I, I really didn't want to go get her and bring her because I knew things were wrong. I just didn't really understand the extent of it. Um, I was woken up in in the early hours one morning. It was dark out, and then I answered the phone to a sheriff, Ooh. and he called me from her town and said. 
your mother has been driving on the wrong side of the road and I've been getting calls and you need to do something about it. Oh Lord. And I, I laid there in bed and I thought, what can I do about it? I'm 3000 miles away. You do something about it, you know, yeah, really. pull her over, take her, take her license away. Um, so that happened. And then about a month later, I got another phone call from a very angry woman from the department of health and human services or health and family services. And, um, my mother had stopped taking her diabetes medication and her hairdresser found her in her home and they brought her to the hospital and they got her stabilized. And when they were ready to release her, she couldn't remember who could come pick her up. So they assigned her a state nurse and the nurse found me from Facebook. Oh Lord. (laughs) Yeah. And, and she was not happy. She's probably seen so many of these stories happen. And she really lit into me about how disrespectful I was to my mother's care and how I was not involved enough. And here I am, I'm talking to my mother every day on the phone and um, basically being fibbed to by a woman who has dementia and can really do a good job of fibbing. Well, that, so, so, but before I get to the second question, I mean, I can't, first off, I can't believe that she, she got crossways with you, so to speak, but that just seems to be really common. It's like, they expect us to do everything, but they don't give us the tools. Is there, in looking back on this situation, is there something that you think maybe that you could have done differently that would have saved you heartache and maybe helped your mom and prevented this idiot woman from yelling at you? You know, not only do I not know a better way to have done it, I'm speaking with so many people now because of my book who are telling me nearly identical stories. And I'm realizing that I don't have an answer for them. I wrote the book. I (laughs) talked about all of the things that happened to me. And my real goal in the book is to help people not feel like such a terrible daughter, son, you know, the, the emotions that go along with caring for somebody, especially in their early stages of dementia. I, that was the goal of my book. And I realized coming out of it that there's still not an answer. When you have a loved one who is perfectly capable of getting in that car and going to the grocery store and going to the bank and half and half paying their bills, <laughs> you, you can't make them do anything even when you know that they are sometimes driving on the wrong side of the road or getting lost coming home, you, to get them out of that car is monumental. Yeah. I've been saying for years, especially here in California, because we are so big that our city infrastructures, our suburban infrastructures are not designed for people who cannot drive regardless of cognitive capabilities Like, you know, I've looked at buying an electric bike because I am not going to put a gallon of milk on the back of my bike and ride uphill. Not my idea of a good idea. You know, it's just (laughs) not going to happen. But, you know, with gas prices being what they are and, you know, do I really need to drive like a mile and a half, two miles tops for my, it's not, it's not more than two miles to the grocery store. Do I really need to drive? And the answer is probably yes. And that's the wrong answer. And then it's just, I get so frustrated that, you know, you did this for eight years. Here we are in the middle of 2022, and we still don't have answers on how to safely care for and protect these people because we're very concerned about, you know, I don't want to use the word stealing, but depriving them of their rights as adult humans that, you know, and I don't want, I don't want anybody doing that to me. So maybe, maybe if people like us keep talking about this, we can, we can come up with some ideas that we can then present to, I don't even know who, cause I'm not sure the government's going to be able to help, but this is a problem that's just going to keep getting worse and, and it's, and more people are going to get yelled at. So <laughs> I wish we could fix that. So my second question was what, why? Oh, did you, um, in, so you were documenting all the goofy things that were going on. And then you turned it into a book. Did you use the documentation to help the medical profession understand that she was good at, 
you know, the little fibbing, the, I forget exactly what they call it, but it's basically like social posturing. Like, you know, they're very good with the doctor and the friends, but they're just atrocious with us, the caregiver, their, their children. For sure. Did that, did that help the doctors or did you not use that tool? I did. I called ahead. I, I would call ahead of the doctor's appointment and say, something's wrong with my mother and I'm bringing her in for an annual checkup. That's what we're going to call this. She's not going to let me come in the room with her because she's suspicious. Um, but please know that there's something wrong and she's going to present to you perfectly normal. Um, I did this so many times and I have to say, even sometimes the doctors didn't get it right. Um, I had one doctor who said, Faye, we're going to talk to you a little bit today about some questions and we're going to see how cognitively you're doing. Well, as soon as my mother heard that, you know, she clenched right up and the interview was over. And I, and I, again, it, this was a doctor that I had called ahead. So like you said, there's just levels of expertise out there that still aren't, that still aren't in place. Nope. And it's dementia terrible. is like one of the number one growing diseases out there, especially with the baby boomer population that's aging. Yep. I know. I, I I'm think assuming we're you and I are prepared. Oh, definitely. It's, it's terrifying. I keep telling my husband, you know, I hope it, I hope it improves because if it's as bad, so he's 57, I'm 55. If it's this bad in 20 or 25 years, Ugh, I don't even want to think about it. You know, we do everything we can lifestyle choices to prevent the possibility of dementia. I mean, you can't prevent it a hundred percent. You can delay it. Maybe if, if you're destined to get it, you can delay it with lifestyle choices and that's what we're doing. But my paternal grandmother lived to 103. So I had a long ways to postpone anything. <laughs> And it's just sad, you know, we're the quote unquote richest country in the world. And yet our, you know, we just dump, dump is probably not a great word, but we just expect families to just drop everything and take care of their loved ones and no training, no, no real help. It's very frustrating. So it's like, we're starting to go down the depressing path. So we'll, we'll turn that around. So what are some of the, you obviously Many of us have experienced the whole, you know, faking it really well with the doctors and other people. What were some of the, besides driving on the wrong side of the road, that's, that's a new one on me. What were some of the interesting uncharted things that she did as in the beginning stages that you wrote down? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, it started with the typical, um, somebody's coming into my house at night. And they're moving all of your grandmother's quilts all over the place. And I come in, in the, I wake up in the morning and somebody has strewn the, qu the quilts everywhere. And then it was, um, somebody's paying my bills for me and I want it to stop. <laughs> I, I said, that's a great problem to have. Yeah. Mom. I would love it. Um, we got further and further along. She, uh, I found her up in the cherry tree that, um, was in the backyard of the new house I had put her in, in Idaho. I came to have dinner with her and she was so high up that I didn't know how we were going to get her down. And oh she my. refused, yeah, refused to come down. So I had a, a bucket of chicken and mashed potatoes with me. And seriously, like a four-year-old, I said, okay, then I guess you're not going to have this gorgeous bucket of chicken and mashed potatoes with me. I'll go back in the house and see you later. Oh and my. 20 minutes later, she was coming into the house. I don't know how she got down, but that was, that was how we did it. Now understand this was in the early days. This was before I was truly convinced that she was as far along as she was. So I gave her this confidence that in my mind, she was perfectly capable still. Sometimes I felt she was faking it. And I hear that a lot from people. Like they think that their mom or their dad is just really grumpy with them or, you know, says cruel things to them and how dare they. And this was happening with my mom and didn't, I just didn't realize that it was coming from a place, you know, of dementia at the time. Um, one of the straws that broke the camel's back was she met a man up at the gas station uh -oh. where she started going <laughs> to buy her, her milk. And she would buy a gallon of milk in the morning and leave it on the counter so that it was, starting to swell up by about three o'clock in the afternoon. So she'd go back up to the gas station and buy another gallon of milk. 
and then put that on the counter and it would start to sweat. And then the next morning it was nearly bursting. She'd go get another. So I'd come over in the morning and find two or three gallons of milk in varying stages of ready to explode. Yuck. <laughs> but one of her last visits uh, to the gas station, she met a man on a bicycle and he made friends with her quickly and told her he was riding cross country. So she invited him to pop his tent in her backyard. And I received the phone call from the back neighbor across the fence and said, your mom has a man in the backyard and he's popped a tent and I can see him in her kitchen through her kitchen window right now. So that's in the book. And that turned into a, a fiasco with the police and jail time for him. Oh, no. <laughs> but it was also one of the tipping points when I realized, you know, burning her neighbor's mail on her coffee table is bad enough. But in, you know, inviting strange men into your backyard to camp for as long as they want was a was a deal breaker. She was burning the neighbor's mail on the coffee table. Oh my gracious! She was con she was convinced that if she burned their mail, they wouldn't be able to listen to her through the letters they were receiving in their mailbox about her. That was okay. how she reasoned it. It's funny because your stories remind me of the next door neighbor when I was growing up. Her husband died. I believe relatively suddenly of a heart attack and he wasn't young, but he wasn't old. I believe he was like in his mid to late sixties. I was like in early high school. So, I mean, I'd like to admit that it was like maybe a couple years ago, but it really wasn't. <laughs> and after he died, she got really goofy. She would, she pulled the plug on the cable because people were watching her through the TV and the little people were living behind the baseboards, which are some serious little people. And then she would, she was on oxygen cause she'd been a smoker forever. And she would drive around in the car with the oxygen tank, which I was led to believe is not a smart idea. I'm not really sure why, but I guess if you're in an accident, it's going to explode. And then she would have incontinence issues in the car and it didn't dawn on me until listening to you talk about some of your mom's uncharted descents into dementia that that is probably what was wrong with the neighbor. She wasn't just crazy. She probably had some sort of dementia. Absolutely. Which this was in the late, mid to late 80s. So he died the summer before I was a senior. So 83, 82. Oof. <laughs> I have to think about it for a bit. And, you know, obviously she, I don't think think they had kids. I don't even remember. Cause you know, they were just the old people that lived next door and they were really nice until he died. And then she got really weird, but yeah, it's just, we have never had a like wholesale way of helping people like that. Like, obviously my parents weren't going to like take over her care. Not that she would have allowed it, but oh, it's just crazy. So this guy on the bike, was he um, you said jail time. So yeah, obviously he didn't, he wasn't just really going cross country on a bike. So he was not, not a good person. Well, he, he uh, put up a fuss when the police came and demanded that he had rights that he didn't have to leave the backyard if he didn't want to, because he was an invited guest. So they were, and he refused to give them his ID. So that prompted um, a background check <laughs> and they found out that he had a warrant. Oh dear. Um, I don't, I never did find out what the warrant was for. But um, they called me the next day just to let me know that it's all taken care of. Oh, no. Jeez. Yeah, imagine the 2020 special that could have been. <laughs> just, uh, yeah, a little bit. He was probably tr probably correct on, he was an invited guest, so he didn't have to leave. But I, I'm not going to go there if a you know, law enforcement personnel wants to see my ID. I'm not going to tell him no, because I don't like. I don't think I'd like jail. I don't want to say I wouldn't. I don't like it. I've never been. But yeah, that's that's scary. And then they're telling you, oh, it's all taken care of. And you're thinking, yeah, as if, I'm sure. Because yeah, you took care of that problem, but the bigger problem just was there still. Oh, and my poor mother that night when it happened, she caught sight of me at the back fence because I stayed hidden. I was terrified. And what I was trying to do was get him to peacefully leave. Um, and once he started to refuse, it got heated uh, with my neighbor. So um, my mother came out to see what the, the noise was and she saw me. 
okay. and just, you know, started screaming, you know, this is your fault. You've done this. Leave him alone. He's my friend. So all of this was happening and the police came and said, why don't you leave, Carolyn, because <laughs> your mother's upset and we'll handle this. So the next morning, you can imagine I was terrified to go see her, but I had to, I had to go see her every morning, make sure she was, you know, in there. And, um, I brought her coffee and some donuts and she opened the door and looked at me and she said, I think I'm mad at you, but I can't remember what for. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's halfway positive. <laughs> and I said, I don't think so at all. Here's some donuts. Let's go have a cup of coffee. And that's what we did. Well, at least you were smart enough to tell her you didn't think she was supposed to be mad at you because that probably just diffused it all. Yeah, there were times, you know, that I got it right. And there were so many times that I got it wrong. And hence the book. Uh, all of those times are mentioned or a lot of them are. And, and um, it's for the people who are going through it now with that same loved one who is with it most of the time, but not with it some of the time. That's that early stage, difficult time. Yeah, I think the early and like the early mid stage, which sometimes sounds like an oxymoron, I think those are the hardest because they know something's wrong. They're trying to hide it. At least that's how it was with my mom and obviously yours. I think that's pretty typical. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're, they've got anxiety because holy crap, something is wrong, but they can't figure out what. And, ugh, you know, they think people are moving their stuff. Did she actually toss the quilts around or was that just a figment of her Oh, she sure, she sure moved them. Yeah. My mother was, um, she hid things. She lost all of her jewelry, um, but she found it. Well, it was robbed from her. She was convinced of it. And then the burglar came back and put it in her laundry hamper. <laughs> so she was thrilled <laughs> when she found it after I had had the keys changed on her house three times oh, because my. she was sure that somebody was coming in. And each time the locksmith went out to change the locks, my mother would get her old keys mixed up with her new keys because she refused to give him the old keys because then he could break into her house oh, with dear. her old keys that no longer worked. This is how her mind worked. I've, I've said a lot that if I was half my age and had twice the scientific cap, cap if I could talk, capabilities, I would go into brain research because I just think it's so fascinating. And, you know, you hear space, the final frontier. It's like, no, brain, the final frontier. Because I think we know more about our universe and our solar system and all that spacey stuff than we do about our own, the workings of our own brains. Right. And, and you said something earlier about, you know, trying, you know, dietary and health style. Um, I agree 100%. And I, and I think that we don't pay enough attention um, outside of the, you know, familial hereditary, you know, questions that are out there. I don't think we, we pay enough attention to feeding our brain, you know, the right, the right foods and, and staying as healthy as we can, you know, look at us as a, as a, a group of people, you know, eating boxed foods and things like that. <laughs> we, we, we need to do better. Yeah. My mom was a two liter a day diet Coke drinker. My dad was a terrible eater. And so we ate, I mean, they ate a lot of Wonder Bread and bologna and just the thought of those things makes me a little queasy because I am, I'm a really clean eater. I had to, about a decade ago, I went on a weight loss journey. Well, a little more than a decade ago, went on a weight loss journey and lost a hundred pounds because I had a photography client that was my previous career who was a doctor. And she said, oh, you're overweight. You have a family history of diabetes, which was on my dad's side. You're screwed. Well, I'm really greatly appreciate that she used that specific term because that just fired up the competitive nature in me. And I was like, in my mind thinking, I'll show you screwed. And I never saw her again after that, but I lost a hundred pounds and there are just things I just can't eat because they just, my system just rejects them basically not a hundred percent physically, but I feel terrible. And I've said a lot also that I really think modern, modern living is not that healthy and you know, we've got more noise, more stress, you know, more uh, pesticides, more yeah. fertilizers. We can't, that's oh, another God. rabbit hole to go down. 
Oh, I'm going to tell you a funny story just because one, I need a laugh and we all need a laugh. So on the cycling trip that I took back in April, we were riding along basically a suburban trail behind homes and stuff in Santa Rosa, California, which is also very agricultural. Now I grew up or I lived for 18 years in an agricultural suburb of San Francisco and I've never had this experience, but we're riding along. The winds are just horrific. And in a field is a, like a high pressure irrigation sprinkler. And when it turned on, it didn't spray water. It sprayed liquefied steer manure <laughs> and the wind blew it back on us. It was just like, ew. <laughs> like, I lived in farmland for 18 years and I never had this nasty experience. <laughs> that stayed with you for the rest of the day? Pretty much. Thankfully, it was, it was the late afternoon. So, yeah, thankfully. But, ew. But it's organic. So, I don't know. We when I In my old hometown, we'd be riding and sometimes the um, crop dusters would come by. We never got sprayed with any of that stuff directly. But you got to wonder, I always tried to steer the group away from the farms that were being crop dusted because I'm sure that's a pretty high concentration of stuff we don't want to breathe or eat or any of that stuff. But yeah, no, I just think, you know, we've we've modernized life and there's, you know, there's a lot of good things like you and I are talking through Zoom and creating a podcast and that's great. But, you know, there's light pollution because where we live now, another funny story, we have no street lights which is great at bedtime because it's dark as sin. <laughs> it's like sometimes finding your way to the bathroom is a challenge. But I went out to get stuff out of the mailbox and I got to the end of the driveway and I was like, I can't even see the road. And silly me, kind of pedonk along, trying to find the opposite side of the road because I knew the mailbox was like one house up. I never did find it. I had to go back in the house and get a flashlight. <laughs> but... You don't realize how much something simple like a street light reflecting inside your window prevents you from sleeping as well as we should. And sleep is what helps regulate, you know, our brain takes that time to like file away all the stuff from the day, repair whatever it needs repairing. That's the extent of how much of that I understand. But, you know, it's just modern life is just kind of insane. So mm -hmm. I don't know. We got to figure out how to. Take all the good from modern life, but keep all the positive stuff from a simpler, quieter life and blend them together. I don't know. Maybe that'll happen someday. As kids, we used to run behind our dad uh, while he was spraying for mosquitoes <gasps> on the riding lawnmower with a tank behind it. And we would run behind him. That reminds me. We, we used to bathe the dogs in malathion to get rid of the tick <laughs> fleas. I wonder why some of those dogs didn't live long. I mean, one of them did get a strange cancer, so big so big shock, right? Oh, my goodness. You know, you, like, literally pour it on them, scrub it in their fur, like, ugh. I, they use that on fruit trees. It's they, like for I don't, bugs and I, worms and things. Yeah, it's mostly for mosquitoes. I don't know if they still do. This was mm -hmm. in the 70s and early 80s, so, you know. But I remember we would... There was like a big hysteria about spraying malathion on things. And as a, you know, older child, almost you know, like a preteen, I'd be like, hey, we use it on the dogs. What's the big deal? <laughs> Apparently, I didn't realize it really was a big deal. And then I was in Jamaica for my 50th birthday, and they were basically fogging an entire, yeah. like, um, it wasn't a sandals, but it was an all-inclusive resort. And my husband and I are like, yeah, we're going to walk the opposite direction of that smoke and looking stuff because no bad stuff. We don't want to deal with that. And that was right before, um, all of my caregiving stuff. My dad, we came home from Jamaica. My dad, who was diabetic, thought it was 1998. This was 2016. So there was a little problem. And then he passed away early 2017, and that's when I realized that my mom was even worse than I thought, and I knew she wasn't good. So, you know, nowadays I'm not even sure I would have stayed in that. That was a really great resort because it was older. It was really cool. But the fact that they were, like, literally fogging the entire, like, outskirts of the resort with something, I'm not sure what it was. But it's Jamaica. You know, they didn't have, like, the same 
environmental laws that we have. So, okay. yeah, not cool. Mm -hmm. But you ran, you ran behind the lawnmower. That's funny. <laughs> so, so maybe not so modern life wasn't good either. I don't know. That's insane. So how long did it, did your mom live in this house before you realized that that wasn't going to keep working? Not long. I got her there and I think I got her there in May and she, I, I put her into an assisted living situation in October. Hmm. So I spent the spring and the summer, uh, early fall with her trying everything until, um, it became apparent that I needed help. Um, I would drop in on her in the morning, have lunch with her and drop in on her in the evening. And it just, you know, there's 24 hours in a day. So she had lots of opportunities to get into trouble. And I would get phone calls and texts all mm. day and into the evening saying, your mother's out on her walk. I just saw her on the South Hill. Your mother just crossed the road and, or your mother just got into a car. I had that a lot. So her keys, her key ring had, uh, call Carolyn and my phone number, but not her address just in case. So yeah. I just constantly got calls from people saying, I picked up your mom. What should I do? Uh, I'll meet you over at the Safeway parking lot. That's, and that stress so, is not good for you. No, it came at any hour of the day. Oof. And, uh, and mom was never happy about the fact that I was going to pick her up. She didn't like to see me. She viewed me as, um, her jailer. Uh, she told anyone who wanted to listen that I was keeping her trapped in a house with no food. Oh dear. Um, it, it, it went on and on. And it, when somebody is telling you this with a straight face and looking you in the eye, it's quite believable. So I often got double looks from people who didn't know what to think because my mother sounded very convincing. Yeah. That doesn't help because then <laughs> they don't know what to do. You know, do they, do they suspect you or, yeah, it's another reason that I, I'm pretty adamant that we all need to learn how to deal with people with, that are different cognitively. We were recently uh, traveling in our RV and we parked next to a family and it was abundantly clear to me that they had an older teen family member who was probably autistic and nonverbal. And the, the trailers were fairly close together. And so I immediately went into like how I would have dealt with my mom. And I thought, well, if he just comes over, I'll just be super friendly and I'll use the teep of snow, hold out my hand and hi, big smiley face. And I'm like, okay, I know how to deal with this. You know, I just, I had to like kind of take a second to like, to think, which we don't always have as caregivers. And I told my husband, because he made a comment like, um, oh, they, they must have, he must be autistic or something. And I said, yeah, it's fine. If he comes over here, this is how you handle it. And he goes, oh yeah, that's just kind of like how you handle your mom. I'm like, yeah, you were great with mom. You were better with mom than I was, which always annoyed me, but <laughs> you know, so it's just, I think we need to understand that we were, I was also at the grocery store and this one bagger was, he was going on and on about Marvel comics and movies. I'm like, I'm just smiling and shaking my head and trying to ask intelligent questions because I had, I'm not a Marvel person. You know, I haven't watched a lot of movies in the last few years. So I'm like, whatever. But I just engaged with him the same way I would have engaged with my mom. And then I asked the cashier, I said, um, I think something I, I tried to acknowledge that I said, oh, um, does this Safeway also hire autistic baggers? And she said, yeah. And I said, I'm so glad that they do that because you know what? They need validation and purpose in life too. And you can almost see the relief like, oh, thank God, this nice lady is, you know, she's not grumping at this bagger who's yakking about whatever. Right. And, you know, I just think it's very important that we all learn how to deal with it because I was just at the grocery store and yeah, I could have been... People. Yeah, I could have been put off. I could have been. They miss it. They they don't realize that that's what they're dealing with. Yeah, because it wasn't really obvious, but he just kept going on and on. And, and there was no like social pause. Like, does this lady even have a clue what I'm talking about? I'm like really passionate about this whatever topic. And is, does she even care? There was none of that. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure that this guy is different cognitively than me, which is not necessarily a better or worse thing. <laughs> so it's definitely, it would have benefited your neighbors if they had had a little caregiver, 
training might not be quite the right thing, but if they had a more understanding, they could have been a better help to you and your mom and probably less frustrated with the whole situation because I'm sure they just loved all that, all that drama you guys were bringing on them. Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. I started using a product that all you caregivers need to try. I started taking AG1 from Athletic Greens after my workouts because I needed a quick and healthy way to refuel my body. While there are lots of options, most don't taste great, and I don't eat or drink things that don't taste good. So what is AG1? Well, with one delicious, mildly tropical flavored scoop, you're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins and minerals, whole food sourced superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to fuel you for your crazy day ahead. AG1 helps support mental clarity throughout the day and you know how important brain health is to this gal. It has over 7,000 five-star reviews and costs less than $3 a day. And you know your time is worth more than three bucks. Athletic Greens was created when the founder experienced a ton of gut health issues and ended up on a complicated supplement routine to recover. I'm sure you're aware that there may be a connection between poor gut health and dementia, so this is another way to help protect your brain. As caregivers to someone with a cognitive impairment, this is also an excellent way to get much needed nutrition into someone who is slowly losing the ability to eat. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D, which is also important for brain health, and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is go to athleticgreens.com slash emerging. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash emerging to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Now back to our conversation. You know, her neighbors really did turn out to be fantastic. They were often the ones that called me just to alert me to something. Um, Even the ones that were losing their mail regularly to her because she was just making a path between her house and theirs. Uh, Any hour of the day, didn't she didn't try to hide it. Just middle of the afternoon, she'd go check their mailbox and take their mail. And um, they called me and we kept trying different things to keep my mother from going over there and, and getting, getting their mail, mostly them meeting the mailman out there so they could take it as soon as it was delivered. But no, her, her neighbors were great. Um, it was usually like you sort of at the grocery store, strangers, strangers who didn't know any better, um, oftentimes gave a double look, you know, didn't, didn't understand what might be going on. But, um, I'd say overall we had you know, lots of, lots of caring neighbors. Thank goodness for that. Yeah. Yeah. So you were her jailer keeping her locked in a house with no food. So I'm sure the transition to a memory care residence was probably what smooth, real easy, right? (laughs) Total sarcasm insert here. (laughs) I think it took three, it was three weeks before I was allowed to go back and see her. They had a one week rule and one week wasn't enough. She was still so mad that they called me and said, let's give it another week. <laughs> and then after the second week, I spoke with the administrator again and she said, let's, let's give it another week. So on the third week, I was so worked up. Number one, I missed my mom and I was suffering from so much guilt that I had done this to her, that this was such a wrong decision. I never should have done it. I should have tried a little harder. I should have been more lenient with her with her idiosyncrasies and her, you know, <laughs> all of the things she was doing. I, I, I overreacted. I was convinced of that. Um, and then I went to see her on the third week, uh, with, with another friend whom she was nicer to. It was like, <laughs> you, like you said, your husband did better with your mom than you did. And, uh, I left that day, a total wreck. Um, I knew, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt she needed to be there, but um, she was so angry, so angry. And, you know, how does a daughter do that to, you know, to her mother? Um, that was what I was struggling with the difference between knowing that she needed extra care and the fact that she didn't think she needed extra care. In fact, was convinced she didn't need extra care. So it, it, it just puts the caregiver into this 
tumultuous situation of making a decision that they know isn't going to be welcomed and is actually going to be, you know, buffed. So, so once again, the book, you know, the, the things that other poor caregivers are finding themselves, the positions they're finding themselves in now, my heart breaks uh, for them because I, I know exactly where they are when they're talking to me now. I know exactly where they're about to go besides all the nuances that go along with it because everybody's different, you know, different mm-hmm. types of dementia, different types of personalities, but I also know where they're heading. Yeah. That's never fun when you could see somebody is like, you know, they're behind you on the path, but you know, what's in front of them. It's like, how much do I tell them that, you know, all your systems and processes and man, you got this down and you're mm-hmm. still going to lose. Yeah. Sorry. You had on a podcast um, I listened to, you had a guest on, and she was talking about um, getting your A-team in place, you know, mm-hmm. getting everything going, get the the small pe- the small volunteers, you know, even if it's one little thing and somebody says, can I help? Get ready to ask them for that one little thing. Like you said, I think it was like, even if you need help with your checkbook, um, even if you need help grabbing things from the grocery store, just little things. And and I thought about that because it sounds ingenious, you know, like, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> but, but don't you find that even with that, they're like, they're like pushing rope up a hill, you know, they're like herding cats, all these cliches, yep. but, but they are, and they can find a way to just undermine your entire day when you thought you had it planned and under control. And, and those are the things I don't know how, I don't know how you prepare somebody for that. That's why I tell people, it's like, you're going to need help. And in the beginning you think, you know, you make some, and you did it, you know, you brought your mom to Idaho and you put her up in a nice place. And thankfully you had nice neighbors to help you deal with her idiosyncrasies, as you said. And I mean, you made adjustments and it still didn't work and you kept making adjustments, but that's why I, the, and I learned this from a podcaster whose family went through multiple um, people having Alzheimer's. Started with his grandmother, and they came together as a unit, which is also not typical. But they divided up the tasks based on who felt comfortable doing what. Well, that's really great, but as I said, it's not typical So I tell people, make a list of all the things that you have to do today to maintain the household. Alzheimer's, dementia, whatever, that's not a factor. What is it you do? You know, like my husband was out of town for 10 days and it was just me and the two dogs and I was forgetting to give them their joint treats. And then I thought, well, I'll just put the joint treats on top of the food bucket then I won't forget. And it's just like, there's all these little things that, you know, when somebody else takes care of them, it takes you time to get them into your routine and make and make it your routine. But now you're taking on more things and you have this person that you need to care for. So you make a list of everything you need to do to run your household today. Make a list of everything you need to do in a week and in a month. And you make a separate list of everybody you know. They do not have to be local, but everybody you know who would be at least somewhat willing to help. And you write down their skills that you think they're really good at. And it, it, and I've mentioned this a number of times, but it bears repeating like every time I do this podcast is don't ask me to call the banks, the insurance companies or any of that stuff. Two seconds on hold or a little more than two seconds, but, you know, 35 seconds to a minute. And I just get super irritated. And then they ask some stupid question and I'm just, you know, my (laughs) rationality is gone. My husband could spend hours on hold And he just makes it a joke. And I try to do that and it's a failure, but I will make you meals. I'll bring you baked goods. You know, I can, there's lots of things I can do. So if you make this list of all the people, you know, and the things that you think that they're best at when they say, oh my gosh, Carolyn, I'm so sorry to hear about your mom. Is there anything I could do to help? Bang, you have an answer and you're not overwhelming them with, oh my God, it'd be so great if you could buy our groceries every week, (sighs) you know, which I'm sure most of us have had that feeling. And then you don't scare somebody off. You've brought them on early in the process so that they're not having to climb the giant cliff of learning curve on how to deal with somebody with a cognitive impairment. 
And it just makes everything so much easier. And then you can focus on your loved one, which is usually easier because if you try to bring in somebody to deal with them, that's when all the breaks go on, as I'm sure you've experienced. Absolutely. The title, uh, Walking with Faye, I started paying my friends to walk with my mother. I had teens and I had my morning walker. I had my afternoon walker. And that's all they did. They just showed up and said, come on, Faye, let's go. And she was waiting for them at the door, sometimes with three pairs of pants on, but <laughs> she couldn't wait to walk. I couldn't walk with her. If I went outside with her, the first thing she did was said, where's your car? I want to go home. Let's go. Put me in your car. I'm not going back in there. And I got that from her every single time. And I, I wasn't ready with an answer. I was her daughter who did what I was told to do. And I literally just panicked. Like, how do I tell my mother that I'm not going to put her in her, in my car and take her where she wants me to take her? So I just stopped. I didn't, I didn't walk with her. That was a perfectly good example. I'm going to go back to the memory care. I find it interesting that the administrator basically quote unquote banned you for the first week to give your mom time to acclimate. And then a second week and a third week. I didn't have that. Now, the executive director of the community my mom lived in told me it would take probably close to a month for mom to acclimate. And I said, I don't know. I was very skeptical. Thankfully, I didn't believe him. But it took my mom six weeks. And this is another story I tell a lot. At first, I would show up, knock on her door, and she'd open the door and literally scream and wail like a prisoner being freed. It was so horrific. My daughter, who is the oldest grandchild by far, she's 14 years older than my niece, stopped visiting. And she and my mom had a super close relationship. But it just crushed her. She just couldn't, couldn't bear to see her grandmother that way. Which, trust me, I could totally relate to. But I didn't, I didn't opt to stop going to see my mom. And then one day I show up, she was walking behind this other resident who was bound and determined. I need to use the phone. Where's the yellow page? Where's the phone book? Oh my God. It was the first year my mom lived there. I was like, I have got to find a flipping phone book to bring for these ladies who are always demanding a phone book. <laughs> I never did find one. They don't, I, don't, I know they still print them, but I could never put my hands on one when, when the thought remained, but my mom was following this woman down the hall. She spied me and she goes, Oh, Oh, come with me. I have to help my friend. And the word friend dang near just did me in. I almost burst into tears. I maintained cause I didn't want my mom to see that, but that word friend sounded sort of like you have won the jumbo lotto and here's a bag of diamonds because I knew she'd finally acclimated and it took six weeks and she had her dog with her. So mm -hmm. she had an extra benefit. So it is, it is the hardest decision. And people say, well, you know, when do you know if it's time to start thinking about memory care? If you're asking, it's, it's, it's probably time. probably time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, you're probably late because, and I don't know, I mean, it's so expensive and there's so many questions involved, but you know, my mom had friends in memory care. She had friends that she wouldn't have had if she'd lived with me. You know, she and I would not have been able to do the things I did with her if she lived with me. So that's, you know, while that is a solution that many people make work, you know, memory care residents is not some sort of jail that we throw them in and go see them occasionally. I was, I was the tech captain of mom's care team and those caregivers in that, in that community they let me know what mom needed. Mama needs new shoes. Mama needs this. Mama needs that. I'm like, could you have told me that on our way out? Cause now I got to bring that stuff back. <laughs> it's just, but you know, we were always a team and that's how I tell people they need to look at it. They're, those people are not there to serve you. They're there to serve your loved one. And we have to, and I don't know if you've, ex you experienced this with your mom, but you almost have to kind of lower you at your expectations because they're just certain things you just got to let go. Like Without the day a my, doubt. Yeah, the day that my mom and I were leaving, we were, I was going to get her nails done. And because she refused to get rid of clothes that were too big, her blouse slipped off of her shoulder. And I looked over and went, <laughs> I wonder whose black sports bra that is you're wearing. And, you know, at first, you know, your mind kind of goes into the freak out mode. And then I just looked at him like, she's clean. She's dressed. It's fine. 
It took me a few minutes to get to fine, but I was not going to make a fuss about it. And, you know, stuff went from her friend's room to her room and her room to the friend. It was just, there was just times I'm like, oh my God, she'd kill me if she knew how she was living. But she was living that way because her brain was diseased. It had nothing to do with me or the, where she was. They took great care of her. So yeah. what, what did you experience in, in the aspect of having to, you know, lower your expectations for their, it's not as, not so much they're lowering your expectations. Yeah. That word does not want to come out. Expectations for quality of life. It's just different. So what was your experience that way? Cause I really think it helps people to understand what we're, what we're talking about. Well, back to the whole, we're all so similar. Uh, your story is so similar. So I don't know if I'm going to come up with something that's you know hugely different than what you're talking about. There was a day I came into the <laughs> her her home and um, she was wearing a pair of John Lennon yellow glasses, big <laughs> yellow glasses. And I looked at them and started to laugh. And she said, what? You've never seen a pair of glasses before? Well, where were my mother's glasses? These were somebody else's that didn't belong on her face. And we never did find her glasses ever again. And in the end, it was fine. She didn't bump into walls. She wouldn't uh, cooperate with an ophthalmologist. So she wouldn't put her face up into the, the little machine to look at the letters on the wall. So we just opted for her to wear those yellow John Lennon glasses until those disappeared. Where they went, nobody knows. Um, just little things like that. Taking baths. You know, it was a monumental effort to get my mother to to take one. So that was always top of mind at the at the home she was in. So there were times where mom's hair wasn't looking its best. Uh, they tried to, you know, fix it or brush it. Those, you know, my mother never would have gone out of the house looking like that. But she was fed and she was clothed and her clothes were clean and they stayed on it, you know. Stayed on it, tried to get her, get her in that shower. And sometimes they succeeded. Yeah. <laughs> that was, that was the, um, that was the end for my mom. She needed two caregivers to, uh, quote unquote, help her with a shower. And they claim, and I, and I say this not in any negative way, but they claim that she went to reach for her clothes after a shower and slipped and broke her leg. And mm -hmm. that was the last, uh, straw for her body. And I laugh because I know that that was their polite way of basically saying my mother was being a complete pain in the ass. I mean, I know my mother my whole life. I know what she did. She went, man, jerked away from them and slipped. Was that their fault? Absolutely not. Um, I did have at the end of 2021, there's two episodes on um, the busy caregiver's guide to all advanced Alzheimer's. And we actually talk about showering and how it might actually be better if, as they progress into the disease, we give them baths. And I have not ever seen an assisted living community with bathtubs, even in the uh, non-memory care apartment. So, you know, there's, there's still a lot of learning that we all need to do on this disease. But, you know, that's, that's one of the hard things for a lot of people to get is that they don't have to take a shower every day. You know, two or three a week is fine. My mom would start combing her hair straight down. St same thing. Stop wearing makeup. Combed her hair weird. She had no butt and she would wear a pair of pants on backwards. I don't know if the <laughs> caregiver understood they were on backwards. They had a tie that was supposed to be in the front. And I finally had to let go of that one because I'm like, they fit just fine backwards. You know, I couldn't put them on backwards, but she had, she could do it just fine. So, yep. Oftentimes her socks were different, but what did I care? My daughter wears different socks all the time because they rarely show. So why does she mm -hmm. care? You know, like whatever. I'm like, it bothers me if, if my socks don't match, but that's, that's on me. Maybe I'm the weird one. Who knows? So is there any last parting advice you want to give anybody? And then you can tell us where they can get the book and why they should get it. Yeah. Um, the, the advice that I would give, you know, that's kind of funny. I'm giving advice on a podcast <laughs> with a person that is, very well versed on dementia. But my advice is what I wished I had done and I don't get a do-over. And that's always so sad. But hindsight allows me to wish that I had found humor in so many of the instances that I found myself in. I, I wish that I could have 
found more of that and not taken it as such an affront. You know, I can't believe mom's doing this. I can't believe mom said this to me. Um, you know, in the end, you can you can care for them, but it it's hard to love them while that's happening. And those are tough words to say and tough words to admit, but um, that's what my book is all about. It's really meant to to humanize the person who's going through it and help them maybe when this is all over, because it's going to be, that they're not going to look back on that whole experience, that whole terrible experience, and have to shoulder the guilt of knowing that maybe they weren't as loving uh, as they could have been. You know, now that it's over, you don't get to go back and fix it. So if there's something you can do now, that's try to step outside of what's happening to you and, and find the love. You know, and it's probably one of the hardest things to do when your mother is shouting at you that you are a thief, you yeah, know, definitely hard to do. But when she's gone, you don't get to give her that last hug. Nope. You know, so I think that's that's my advice. My advice is find the humor, try to try to find the love when they're the least lovable and um, and read my book. Yeah, there you go. Because <laughs> it's going to help you with that. I believe that wholeheartedly. My my biggest wish was that I wished that, that I could just roll with it better with my mom. I was always trying to be respectful and trying to understand what she was trying to tell me. She spoke in, in English words and full sentences, but there was no context. So you'd be like, eh, what the are you trying to tell me? And if you scrunched up your face, it pissed her off. So I had to learn not to do that. The days that I was able to just roll with her weird comments, like my brothers Those are normal people days. now. Yeah. It was like, yeah. I was more relaxed. She was more relaxed. And I'm like, yeah. why can I not get out of my head? her. I didn't correct her, but I just, I couldn't get out of my head trying to like be respectful and, and, you know, show her dignity and all this other stuff. It's like, <laughs> just give it up. Just go with it. Like with kids, we don't, you know, we just play with them. We, you know, we... What's the right word? My daughter's 30, almost 31. So it's kind of, it's hard to remember back that far, but we just, we just go with it. We like live in their fantasy, but we mm -hmm. have a much harder time doing that with our parents who have some form of dementia or Alzheimer's. So yeah. I think we want it to go away. You know, we just, possible. we just want this. We don't want this to be happening. So we want to reason it out of them. I Whereas definitely kids, agree. Yeah. And with kids, you know, they're that way because they're little and they're just forming. But you were just raised by this parent who is now exhibiting, you know, uh, behaviors that you have never seen before. And you don't like it. You want it to go away and you want the old one back. Yep. I can totally, yep. Totally agree with that one. So you can find Walking with Faye on yes. Amazon and she's got to be watching the video because now she's showing <laughs> this beautiful cover. I love it. Um, I'm assuming that's Idaho because that doesn't look, it's a drawing, but it's, it's a drawing. Yeah. It's a depiction of my mom walking with, uh, with me walking with my mother. Okay. Yeah. In the forest or trees that look yeah. like fall colors. <laughs> Starting walking toward the light. <laughs> okay. Oh, subtle hint. <laughs> yeah. In, in the fall of her years. You could also get it on barnesandnoble.com and Amazon. Goodreads. That's Good the raise Amazon, anywhere you buy books, it's, uh, it's available online. You can get it at your local bookstore. Just go there and ask them for it. And, uh, if they don't have it, uh, they'll order it for you. Um, it's available on, uh, uh Kindle, uh, ebook and the audio version is being produced right now. So it will be available on audio. Awesome. Are you doing the audio or did you get no, somebody else? I got someone else. That was a really interesting experience to I'm go sure. through all the aud auditions and yeah, <laughs> trying to find a voice that sounded like me talking. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, the book, a couple of places to buy the book are linked in the episode notes on the app. And I appreciate this wonderful conversation today. It's brightened my mood, even though this is not always the easiest topic to discuss. I hope that you feel the same way. And I do. It was a pleasure. Pleasure meeting you and being on your podcast. Thank you. You're welcome. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.